reconvene the meeting for the St. Mary's County Board of Education for Wednesday, February 8th, 2023. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, let's see, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move approval of the agenda as presented. We have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. We will we begin with Dr. Smith and Monica? Your, your tour of schools? Fantastic. Um, <laughs> First and foremost, every every other week we send out the Signal newsletter to all staff. It's our in-house publication and it's our way to let everybody know what's going on. And, and for this week, um, we are starting into the third marking period. And so we start the beginning of the year with a focus on connecting with our children with one another. The second marking <coughs> period is uh, creating a sense of belonging for all who are involved in the great work of educating children. And the third marking period or the third quarter goes to aspiring. How do we help everyone set challenge goals for themselves and then give them the support to be able to reach them? And that really is the third marking period. And this is when we find ourselves in assessments and all the things that kind of go on with a normal school year. So the last is issue of the signal, what um, we moved into the aspiring theme, but perhaps one of the best parts of the signal, and if you haven't read it for all of our employees, 2,300 of them, we hope that you take the time to go through it and click on all the links. But in this uh, issue, we had the spotlight on staff. So, uh, and as we draw 2022 to a close in November and December, we ask all of our schools to look across the incredible staff that they have and identify outstanding examples of what it means to work on behalf of children. And so each school has an education support professional that they put forward of all the education support professionals at that site. Every single school puts forth an, uh, an outstanding educator from their building to say this is truly an, an exemplary teacher. And then we have overall as a system, the leader of excellence. We will then go on to have finalists and then ultimately finalists, we will have a single representative for ESP, teacher of the year, student uh, uh, principal of the year, and they will find themselves onto our wall of, of fame. So this is the first step of it, and it's so important uh, as we talk about aspiring in the third quarter. These are truly inspiring people who draw us to aspire more for ourselves. So congratulations to all that, that are named. We're gonna be getting out to seeing you. We'll be visiting our finalists. We'll be recognizing them as we go through the second part of the school year. Also in the signal is the fine arts spotlight. So in the event that you aren't able to catch up on all the great things, visual and performing that are going on in St. Mary's County Public Schools, um, it is in the signal and we clicked. And so uh, the fine arts spotlight this time was for 12 angry jurors. Um, uh, Chopped Gun High School uh, was able to wedge in a, 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 a theatrical performance, a dramatic play before we get into musical season. Uh, really, really well done and a pretty high concept. They only they were sold out every single night, but they were sold out every single night because they actually performed in the center of the stage and then they built scaffolded seating all around it. So there was only about 80 people in the audience to the 12 people performing the play. Um, I have read, I have taught, I have read parts in 12 Angry, Angry Jurors. It's been around, it's considered kind of canon in, uh, in American lit. Um, this was one of the best performances I had seen, and because it was presented the way it was presented, it was very, very um, you know, visceral. You, you felt it, uh, and, great, and great topic. So um, to Brave House Productions, uh, to uh, Brandon Marr, who, was, um, who is the teacher and director um, of that, uh, it, was a really great, it was a really great performance. Now, you might have missed it because that's, there was only a handful of seats each one of those nights, um, but that's okay because we have really big theatrical events coming up um, our, our spring musicals. And if you haven't gone to a spring high school musical, y you need to. Um, it, they're, they're, just, they're just utterly fantastic. They draw in all the talents of the school. Um, and then uh, really, it's, you know, it's as good as you're gonna see 
period down here other than going to perhaps Newtown players. Um, but uh, we have first coming up is going to be Great Mills High School with Greece. Um, really awesome in uh, the second week of March. Then we have The Music Man from Leonardtown the third week of March. And then going over into April, Chops kind of comes back on the scene with uh, a very contemporary um, Broadway play, uh, Mean Girls. And so those are going to be all very good. I hope that uh, I will find myself at each one of those, and I'll always be looking for somebody to join me. So, you know, I'm just saying, it's a lot more fun to experience the theater with others. So come on, we'll get tickets. <laughs> This week is National School Counseling Week. Now, at the next board meeting, which is an evening board meeting, we will be recognizing and talking about the great work that counselors do. But this is just an FYI to get everybody out there to recognize this is the week to recognize how important it is to have counselors that are elementary, middle, and high school level working with children, helping them navigate all that is academic. And ultimately, they're planning for the future at the, at the secondary level, and that's this week. So here we find ourselves in February. The second marking period has started. We're, and we're going to be closing it out on the second week of the, I'm sorry, the third marking period. We're going to be closing out on the second week of the third marking period. We have an early dismissal this Friday. We have President's Day off on the 20th. Um, the President's Day is, uh, can also be a snow makeup day in the event that we've had so many snow days that we need to make some up. I don't think we're going to have a snow day this year. I really... Oh, like famous it. last I, words. I, I, I'm tempting. I, Mother Nature, I don't believe you have it in you. Um, I lo oh. We love snow. I want it, but it, I mean, I don't, I don't know. So we have uh, President's Day. It's an eventful week. And we are, with this week, getting back into the normal schedule with the Board of Education where we just have a morning meeting at the, at the second week and then an evening meeting, and we'll go back to a regular meeting schedule. I appreciate your patience as we have had meetings every single week and two weeks we had double meetings so to all those on the board thank you very much to all those who support the board <laughs> Ms. Short thank you very much um, it is Black History Month and so we have um, as, we've, as we've highlighted before we go with the uh, with Casey Page's uh, graphic arts program over at the Tech Center and we said could you design using our logo uh, a back insert uh, aligned to the message of the of the month or the celebration or the recognition and um, so this is by um, Kai Denny uh, Leonardtown High School students uh, Leonardtown High School student what a what an incredible um, graphic beautiful visual logo and of course we're going to be pushing it out and you'll see it at the bottom of letters and logos and things like that for the month of February so with that um, I turn it over to um, the student member of the board Monica Suara to give her update okay awesome thank you um, first of all I just wanted to say happy Black History Month um, I wanted to highlight that Leonardtown High School has um, restarted its Black Student Union this year. Um, actually, one of my close friends, Jordan Walters, um, was the person who pushed that back into um, you know, our extracurricular uh, set of activities. So i um, very uh, grateful for that because I know that it has been um, a really wonderful opportunity for um, black students at our school to um, gather and, you know, um, collaborate and um, experience things together. And then also um, myself and uh, many other individuals who do not identify as black um, have been able to go to those meetings and learn more about um, you know, culture, history, all of the above. So um, yeah, shout out to Leonardtown High School Black Student Union. Um, and then I don't have much else in the world of updates. I just wanted to say that Dr. Smith and I will be beginning our secondary school visits um, very shortly, so I'm very excited. Um, we're going to talk about all things college and career readiness. We're going to talk about, um, you know, what our students need from us as well. So, yeah, I'm very excited. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Man, short and sweet, you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. We have no recognitions, public hearing. Any public comment? No. No public comment. Okay. Then I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda <clears throat> as presented. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, let's see. We have three action items this morning. The first one is Mr. Howard with phone system replacement. Looks like a very monumental task, Mr. Howard. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
this morning I'm bringing Mr. Michael Reese. Um, he's our project coordinator who is our main point of contact on the phone system. Um, just so if we have any questions, he's going to help with the presentation. Our current um, phone system is an Avaya telephone system. It was installed in school year 12-13. Um, we have 1,000 active handsets or phones in the system today. Um, and some of the benefits, it's been very reliable, um, but it is an outdated, antiquated platform. Um, it utilizes a lot of older communication services, connecting to local telecom providers. Um, mostly right now, it's um, BreezeLine. Um, it is limited um, our ability during the pandemic as we were not able to provide um, remote and mobile services. Um, there was some time when we had to um, work from, I think we couldn't be in their building for a week, so we reached out to one of our providers to look at how we could still answer the calls um, that are published, and um, you know we couldn't use our current system to do that. Um, one of the other, um, issues that we're dealing with is a um, lack of pathway diversity. Um, <coughs> last school year we had, um, BreezeLine had an outage that um, fortunately for us it happened right before four o'clock. Um, they were down <laughs> for I think it was about seven, eight hours mm -hmm. system wide. Yeah, so if that would have happened in the morning we would not have had you know, very limited phones. It would have been more cell phones and old analog um, phones like a, a you know white marsh for the one and the ones that we had available at the time so we we're looking at that as a design requirement um, so I'm going to hand this one over here for Mike to talk a little bit about our design requirement <coughs> um, when we went out to look for a replacement we wanted something that was going to be reliable and dependable um, we wanted something that could be used virtually on multiple platforms um, so we were looking at laptops iPads cell phones along with a physical handset um, we wanted um, people to have more ways of communicating so um, having inbound numbers for each person instead of that one number um, we're still going to keep the one number that answers into our auto attendance but everybody can have their own number to get calls directly to them without people having to go through that auto attendant to get to them. Um, we wanted to make sure that we're in compliance with 911. 911 has some new requirements that came out uh, a few years ago. We want to make sure that we are compliant with that. Um, we wanted a provider that was known, um, somebody that's um, highly regarded in the industry. And uh, <coughs> we want to be able to improve um, production and hopefully reduce costs with it. And uh, we want network resili resiliency with it. Um, we have two internet providers, so going with a cloud-based system gives us that built-in redundancy with two providers. Um, the <coughs> platform that we're looking at is uh, Avaya's cloud office. Um, they're in uh, conjunction with Ring Central. Um, we currently have an Avaya system, so this system is very similar to the one we have. Um, right now we have uh, two main servers that run our entire system, and then we have gateways at each site to connect the old analog systems to our current phone system. Uh, the system we're looking at now has no on-premise equipment because it is cloud-based. Um, so we have maintenance fees with our current system, so we have that same day support and next day replacement. Um, we'll be able to eliminate that and uh, we'll be less prone to issues from storms and stuff without having that on-premise equipment. Um, we have two internet providers, like I said, so um, if something happens to one internet provider, we'll be able to have our phone conversations through our redundant provider. And uh, the new system is uh, 
all built in so users won't have to look up the person that they're trying to call within the system that contact list is built into the into the software of the new system so they'll be able to scroll through the list select the person they want and choose which form of communication they want to use with that person um, phones are an updated version of what we currently have um, our existing phones are very similar to these. These are just color displays, newer. And the phone on the, um, on the right side gives um, the individuals who have to manage multiple lines a bigger ability to do that. So I think we're buying 100 of those in this proposal. Yeah, I think it's 100, 100, okay, 120 um, for the people who currently have that ability now. Okay. Um, when we were looking for it, we had a list of requirements that we wanted to meet. Um, first was that we wanted a system that would be robust and last at least seven to 10 years. Um, it had to have the ability for many auto attendants and over 1,100 users. Um, we wanted it to be a cloud-based system, so we would have that redundancy for service. Um, we did not want it to be dependent on local um, dial tone providers and infrastructure. Um, we wanted to be able to have um, hunt groups and call queues, so calls will come in and roll through multiple people. Um, <clears throat> and we were looking for something that had multiple forms of communication, something that would give us video, audio, um, texting, and faxing um, all in one system. Um, and then it gives you the ability to have the handset on the desk or a software-based phone on your laptop, your iPad, your cell phone, uh, all of which are the same device. So the call can be answered on any device, transferred between each device. And then um, the uh, DIDs are selectable, so when you make the call, you can either make that call from your individual phone number or from your main building number. Which, um, we've had a lot of um, administrators say, I don't want to give out my cell phone number or some staff. This gives that ability to like, this is our business communication line. You don't need to give out your personal one. And there's a lot of other um, value in doing it that way. Um, and you know, some of our staff now who have a physical phone, they travel between sites. So to get that ability, if they have space, they're going to have multiple handsets. Now they can take their laptop equipped and they have their communication device built in with the laptop. Um, so it's going to really, we've noticed in review that some people have two to three phones that are going between sites and that's going to, you know, not, right. no longer be that's the case. Two to three phones at three different <coughs> sites with three different voicemail boxes that they're trying to keep up with. This will cut that down to one, one extension one mailbox, one device that they can then utilize everywhere. Um, the, we did a pilot program for this um, and it was very successful. We had 20 piloted users. Um, it was a 60 day pilot. It's still active. They've been very generous to us. Um, they know, we, we feel we're a good customer and they've been a good provider for us with the current system. So um, it, it's been, you know, one of these ones that it's like, you know, myself and Dr. Jaffers use it exclusively now for our communications and um, we're yeah. up to 45. We have 45 now. now. They gave us a little more. So that, that's been nice. So we really got to make sure this is our solution we wanted. Um, and the individuals, we, um, you know, we did most of it on the, the laptop instead of the physical handsets. And um, you know, the feedback has been really well received. Um, and we, you know, we had feedback. We did it in an A&S session, and some of the schools found that it was a great way of doing. They were doing the video calls with this too, and reliability compared to some of the other mechanisms that we've used, it's been very high. Um, Quality's been tremendous, so we're very pleased with the performance of it during this pilot. So you have that. What did? Can you explain the ability to offer a virtual phone to the teachers? Yeah. So, so what here's so mean? here's the so there's 23. <coughs> there's enough licenses that we're buying that every single person could have an assigned number in this system. 
So it, every single employee okay. could have an assigned number within this system. So for example, at the last board meeting, we talked about the fact that we just distributed or are distributing or 2,300 2, laptop. laptops. Right. iPads. iPads, iPads right. pardon me, iPads. With this software, you can, I could call directly in, like let's say that Ms. Penrod was in her classroom, I would be able to call directly into Ms. Penrod's classroom on her iPad and be able to text her, talk to her, or video chat with her. You mean FaceTime? Uh, FaceTime. Okay. Yeah, video. So, and and it, it connects to the, wi the Wi-Fi system within a school. So there isn't, like right now, what you'll hear consistently across all of our schools that I, my, cell doesn't, my cell doesn't work, right? right. Yeah. All of this will work because your, your, phone, your phone or your device is authenticated and connected to our network and it's, and it's there. So we believe that for communication purposes, this is, this is, an, ev this is an evolution of being able to, to, to follow things. For example, like right now, I have the software, the Avaya software is running on all of my devices plus my laptop. <laughs> So when Dr. Jaffers calls me, my entire office explodes. <laughs> and I can, I can answer him on this phone, I can answer him on this phone, I can answer him on my iPad, or I can answer him on my computer. So are you one, is he one seat or is he four seats? No, it's just, it's one, just one, one, it's one number. It's one so number across all, of, number all the platforms. Okay. To answer them on the computers, super easy. Press a button, there you go. We're talking back and forth. All the all staff people have a laptop as well. That's it's it's really easy. <laughs> Yesterday we had Maureen was in, Dr. Montgomery was in the office. You can add people. We did a video. We we're doing video chat. You can add people in, and and it it's it's all seamlessly run across our network. So it really works really well inside of our buildings. But more importantly, it's it's. The software is running on the on the devices. It's totally separate. So right now, people call me on my personal cell phone or my school system cell phone. Um, this partitions it all, and it's all in the Avaya, the Ring Central cloud. So that also really helps us in the event that you know there's something after the fact, or there's some litigation that wants to do a litigation hold. They're not doing a litigation hold on my sell my personal devices it's just what's in ring central because all of our business is, now is being ring. conducted in ring central okay so it really does partition off you know private life and all the stuff and your and your professional so, life okay so now i'm going to i'm going to bridge so now all of the stuff that then we have in the budget that we've been talking about for IT upgrades or that we approved in the last what four weeks I think yeah. that will all go to further support this yes I'm um, strengthening our infrastructure giving um, the more <clears throat> redundant because right now our two internet providers one's really large one's small so we may want to look at balancing that out like maybe during the summer do a you know an exercise um, or just you know just run the numbers and see what it would be if we okay. were and our main provider is provided by the state, so if right. they're having issues, it's going to be a big event typically. And okay. um, reliability has been very high, but we may want to look at our, um, we use Sailor for our one that we get through here. We may want to look, see if we can upgrade that just in case that does happen, we have the ability. But everything we're doing, building a stronger infrastructure, this, it, it works well. If we, okay. maybe five years ago, this probably would have been a joke. If we tried There's this. no way we would have been the able to The Wi-Fi was not, yeah, yeah. we, We've okay. had to put a lot of energy in redesigning the network, and that goes to well, you know, all these efforts we've been doing um, in support, like using our E-rate reimbursement wisely. Everything okay. that you don't see, hopefully you don't see in a school room. Right. I can't say you never see it, but yeah, all that wiring, it's on, it's on, it's on all those keeping rooms. that current. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to have some other larger purchases to continue that operation, making sure the power for those closets is really high because it's not just Wi-Fi now; it's communication too. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's my question. Are you going to have the bandwidth to be able to support all these devices? We, we are. We will. We have. And we're looking at doing an upgrade right now, one gig, um, working with the state going from um, our, our six gig to seven gig. Um, so we, and I budget for almost a gig a year if we need it. So if I don't, we look at, we monitor it all the time on how we're doing on our bandwidth and going into testing, we felt we needed to do a modest upgrade. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, no, I, I kind of needed fine. like clarification. <clears throat> 
Um, I mean, and, I can read it, but. Oh, no, that's fine. That's why I like the real world one. example. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. you know, I appreciate it. We are proud time. of the system, so we, and the questions are great. We'll make sure everybody is, because um, we've been testing it for a while now. Mike, on the virtual phones, you want to just, the inbound and outbound dialing, what's the difference between a virtual phone and that um, 1,100 phones that we're buying? There, there is limits, like for the teachers would be, right? Um, so the teachers, um, for people to call into a teacher, they would have to call the main number of the building, get to the auto attendant, and then transfer to the teacher. They would not be able to dial directly into that teacher. And the same thing for outbound call. They, of, of a typical phone, they could use the video component without they any issue. It's more components. the traditional yes. phone. Yep, yeah. it's just the traditional phone. Yeah, our goal is not to have no. everybody calling. T no, this is <laughs> this is more for is this is more coming from. What we've had traditionally with staff requests, which is the ability for them to place phone calls from their classroom without having to use their own personal devices, you know, like that. That that's a that's a that's something that re, that mm -hmm. consistently is made as a request from from classroom teachers. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a breakdown of the current cost that we have. Um, and if, if you see that you know we've got you know fax lines we're not looking at pulling them out now but as we test this and move this this is something that everyone can receive a fax through this system do we need to have 45 fax machines in the school system so those are some <coughs> future potential savings but right now we want to replace what we have add more to it um, and you know just exploit this the best we can um, and as Mike alluded to the carousel support that line we're not going to need that with the new system so you know, basically just showing out how we, um, the, our current costs were almost $200,000 a year on communication with the support for it. And doing the cost comparison, um, we've got a really good rate um, for this since we've been working with them for a while. Uh, I think the, their retail is like $24 a, you know, per line per month. We're able to, you know, get it at, you know, $6.49. And then you start seeing these mandatory fees like the E911 service fee um, and you know the other ones are compliance and administration fees. So the federal government and state government has to get their share right. of this proposal. So that's going straight somewhere else. Um, and we have our um, unlimited standard plan like we have today. Um, and let's see, the one-time cost is 100 phones. That was that um, phone with the sidekick, they call it for the multiple line supports and there's the expansion module um, and we were able to get this one a thousand phones in this proposal for um, included free so that deal expires the end of this month right yes yeah, and I don't think it's going to be offered again so you know timing is actually on our side because I you know Mike and I've been talking about when it's the best time to do this and towards the end of the school year is always best. You don't want to do this in the summer when people aren't there. You want people to have time to know what they're getting into because the start of the school year is really about the kids, the classroom. We don't want them learning a whole bunch of new technology and starting the school year off. So this is a good time for us to do this upgrade. Um, and then there's the installation and training cost that it gives us a project manager assigned to us as well. Okay, and this is just a summary of um, the 23 and 24 budgets. Um, and looking at the difference so after we make this conversion and cut over we're looking at 161 thousand a year with the new system so we're, we're doing so much more for annually less so those savings can help strengthen our backbone if we needed to um, and we're working with Ms. McCourt's um, office all the time and trying to make sure we have the funding to do everything we need to and it's documented so you know a lot of uh, good things with this new system and I'm glad we did a, do a pilot project um, because the vendor wants you to buy it, buy it now. They were pushing us pretty hard to get it in September. Yeah, they um, are. But sure. Dr. Smith got on a call. He wasn't sure that the vendor was going to be a part of that call, yeah. but um, you know, they, they kept pressing, and I said, look, you have the superintendent, Dr. Smith's attention. He likes this. You, you had him for like 40 minutes on that call, right? And um, oh, yeah. you know, thank you for being patient with them, Dr. Smith, and um, you know, I think you helped set us in a good position with them. Yeah. Um, the, the, the big thing is, is that this... This is going to be an incredible amount of, of work. We do have fantastic um, subject matter technical proficiency with with Mike Reese in Absolutely. particular. I mean, he's he has watched through and been part of all the evolutions of, of communication and certainly voice over internet protocol and all of this. Um, 
I have been using the system um, for the last two or three months. Uh, it's, it's great. One of the great things that it does is when somebody calls your number and leaves you a message, it transcribes the message and then it sends you an email with all the information as to who called, when it was, how long it was, and the transcribed mes message in the transcription is pretty darn good. So um, it, 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 is, it is the next evolution of communication and, it, and I, um, I, I appreciate the due diligence that was done to get us to where we are today and ready to come before you for an action item. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Okay. Um, I don't have any questions, but I'd just like to say thank you um, because uh, it's it's great to see us responding to um, something that our staff wanted and um, will definitely benefit them. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jim? I was thinking uh, when the telephone service came out and changed from uh, dial to push button, <laughs> um, I... Uh, Monica phone okay. way back hey, when. It I used to be it rotary dial or something. I swear. <laughs> I can tell you, I tell you, why, why spend this money? Yeah. I mean, maybe it saves you a little bit. I didn't understand that it has much greater dimension. Yeah. So I, I see what's being said here, what you're saying here about the greater dimension. Uh, the only question I have is, is there any residual value of the old system? We looked at that, and we, we did, and it is... Um, because there's a resale market, but not for these devices um, at that time. Um, we may still be able to try to donate them to a good cause or um, use them with, um, we use gov deals sometimes for these things, um, but we'll have to assess that. Maybe the equipment that's in the building, but it's really to the point that it's um, end of life, um, believe mm -hmm. it or not, with this. But yeah, getting you know, 10, 11 years out of a system, and it, it has been, it hasn't really been the pain point it's been more the old copper lines if we had any issues. Our Spring Ridge was one. Have been more of our issues than internal. We had some issues with lightning damaging equipment, yep. but um, with our maintenance contract, I was able to get replacement stuff next day, and we're right back up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's all but I have. Very little of that. Thank you. So, you, are we still having breeze line? Is breeze line still going to be used? Because you said um, breeze still line is system. going to be used for the connectivity of some of our schools. They uh, will still oh. be used. Um, okay. We're going to need local providers for our elevators, our alarm systems. So breeze line will still be the provider for the dial tone for those items. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation, and I appreciate um, the pilot program that you did for 60 days, and you did not bow into pressure <laughs> to buy right away. It's tough sometimes. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much for that. So you've tested it, and it's been approved. It works. People like it. And so the board will vote on it. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Thank you. You've already answered my questions, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> okay. May I have a motion? I move. I'm, sorry. Oh. I ahead. move that the Board of Education approve the use of TIPS contract 210101 awarded to Avaya for the purchase of a Ring Central Cloud based <clears throat> phone system. I have a second. A second. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Good to go. Thank you. Go off and purchase. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ms. Bachner. Good morning. Good morning. I am here for the second reading of the program of studies, and I promise I don't think it's going to be as long as the first reading. So, um, we'll we'll jinx us. What? <laughs> don't jinx us. I won't jinx us. So as I said, I'm here for the second reading of the program of the study, uh, studies and approval at the end of this presentation, hopefully, by the Board of Education. Um, the first reading was done on January 12th with the board, and at that time, you did ask for one consideration and change to the board, which was the addition of an AP study period semesterized course. So we did add that, and you'll see that is what we're asking to be approved. I did do it also a communication update in regard to that course because it was 
a zero credit course. So I just wanted to make sure, I don't think I was clear um, with that, but after I did some research, I wanted to make sure that the board knew exactly the course that we would be proposing and putting into the program of studies. And the rationale for that is it doesn't come with a curriculum, um, and so it would not have credit. So all um, for this presentation, I am going to move through the slides. I'm not going to say anything um, unless I'm stopped by any board member to have clarification on anything. So the new courses. And here's where it was added, the AP study period for the, the half credit. Then we move to course name changes for CTE. A course description change for all our world language German classes. Then we move into course description changes primarily for those health and science classes. Then we made some grade band changes um, so that we could actually make the classes more accessible to more students. We did some prerequisite changes also, again, to make the classes more accessible um, to more students and also validate the experiences they were coming to us with. Um, and in particular for sciences, we also made a very clear look at this, the math requirements to change our prerequisites so that they mirrored the math requirements um, coming into those classes. We also asked for a couple repeat courses. And we asked for the deletion of HVAC, case, aviation, and pre-engineering one and two based on enrollment and other factors as shared at the first reading. So at this time, I ask if there's no questions that the Board of Education approve this agenda item as presented. Do you have anything? I do not have any questions. Thank no you. questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Harry? No questions, thank you. No questions. All right. Thank you for the half credit AP study. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Actually, everybody's very excited about that. So thank you very much for the um, See, look at that. suggestion. That was a good addition. Yeah, yeah. it was a very good suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. <clears throat> I'm sure they'll all win it like the second half of the year, not the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Zero and then like 50 kids. So. All right, may I have a motion? I move that the Board of Education approve the high school program of studies revisions for 2023-2024 as presented. I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Dr. Beavers and Mr. Watson. Back to Chopticon. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get out there for you. Can you look at that motion? Oh, I know. Yeah, I'll change it when we do it. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All morning. right. Go ahead. Yep. So um, we're here before you today just to um, appro seek approval for our uh, contractors for the Chopticon Gymnasium project. Um, the, that's replacing the bleachers and the floor at Chopticon High School. Uh, we're also, um, again, to master care flooring for the floor and to TJ distributors for uh, the bleachers and a construction contingency of $49,613, which is a, like a 9% 9, 9 uh, con construction contingency. We're, we usually feel a little bit more comfortable around 12, um, but we will make do with, with what we have. So um, as you know, uh, we, we, we came before the board and sought approval for use of fund balance. So we're very fortunate for that, uh, to, be able to use fund balance to support this project. Um, very fortunate the county commissioners also agreed for us to use our fund balance for this process. Um, over the years, uh, as you can see a few pictures, um, one from uh, Mr. Sapp sitting there circled in the middle of the gym floor. <laughs> We've had our uh, issues at Chopticon. Great photographer. Um, great photographer there. Yeah, credit uh, Miss Bailey for that picture. Um, but we've had some issues at Chopticon High School Gymnasium, to say the least, over, over the last few years. Um, we've done our best to um, band-aid those and make the floor playable and make the floor as nice as possible um, over the years. Uh, we have had some 
interesting ideas and thoughts as to why it's doing this and we've had some uh, insurance claims and things like that that have um, supported some of our uh, repairs to make the floor playable but um, we, we don't necessarily know what's underneath this floor uh, per se except for the front end of the of the gym there because uh, that's where we have torn up and, and redone over the years um, so we are um, to the point where this floor needs replaced obviously um, so we've had significant water damage as you can see the life cycle of floors is a, is a long time and we are certainly before that on this floor um, but we've had significant issues um, where we are band-aiding this floor year after year after year and it's time to do a overall haul of a replacement of, of the wood so uh, the existing bleachers as you can see were installed in 96 um, the floor wasn't supposed to be completely redone until 43 but um, as I said before we've had significant issues with the bleachers significant issues with the floor that warranted um, the use of fund balance for this project can you just explain to the board because clearly I'm aware of it mm -hmm. but that the water damage is underneath the floor it's not it's not on top Correct. Right. So yeah. So there's a, actually like a pulling water. <coughs> yes. So there's 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 been water damage from across across the main hallway there from the um, from the um, courtyard. Courtyard. Thank you. From the courtyard coming across, getting underneath the gym floor. Uh, there's also a like a four foot kind of crawl space underneath that gym floor for whatever reason, um, and that has a lot of humidity and things. And we've tried to mitigate the floor issues by putting fans and dehumidifiers down there and. Um, you name it, we've tried it. Um, but that's over the years we've had those issues. And <coughs> the reason Mr. Sapp is actually sitting in the middle of the floor is because that floor, as it you know, floats and uh, contracts and expands, the floor actually came up like a broken ship, right? And so like there was all kind of probably like four or five inches of wood sticking up where if a volleyball student or student athlete um, got close to that, Mr. Sapp was going to get up and play some zone defense on them. <laughs> so and, uh, you know. yeah. <laughs> like the earth's mantle it pushes up and yes so to say the least we've had our fair share of issues at, with uh, with the gymnasium. If you made those repairs so if you put a new floor in you're not going to have the same problem. That's that's the hope yes sir and by putting a new floor in, we also reestablish a warranty uh, with the company as well so uh, right. hopefully like, if there's any other issues underneath um, the majority of the floor we will I mean, certainly it, run into yeah, those. Yeah, like the water the actually time. pulled, like when they pulled up the caps to put the volleyball poles in, there's mm -hmm. a, there's water there's in, like, in the, in, pool, in, yeah, the, in, in the, the post. In the, sure. It's, yeah. it's completely wild. But you're you're going to take care of that before putting a new floor in. Right. I hope so, yes, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. So. We, have t we have tried multiple times to just fix or address the spot. We are currently on the, the you know, it's screwed down. Yes. <laughs> Um, not an elegant solution, no. um, but it'll get us hopefully through the end through the end of the year. Yeah. All right. So, uh, as you all know, piggybacking uh, contracts is permitted. I won't read the whole regulation, but we are um, going to utilize Mastercare Flooring, who has a contract with Baltimore County Public Schools through April 30th of 23, and then t TJ Distributors for the for the bleachers. Uh, they're a dealer for Hussey Seating Company. Who has a cooperative purchase, purchasing agreement with Sourcewell, uh, and that's good through December of 2023. The scope of work, as you can see from the illustration, it, this isn't your living room um, hardwood floor system, right? There's a, there's a whole lot of subfloor that goes into it underneath, and as you can see from that illustration, um, you know there's like two and is it two and a quarter inches <coughs> beneath the act, actual maple flooring, so. It's quite an extensive job. So beginning in early June, uh, after graduation, the, uh, the demolition will start, so uh, existing bleachers and flooring will, will uh, be removed. Uh, any high spots, any issues with the concrete floor, obviously those will have to be addressed before they apply a vapor guard, which will help some of that moisture from penetrating the subfloor. Um, subfloor is installed, adhesive and fasteners, um, these are the, these are the, um, this is what's being installed, the 25, 30 seconds by two and a quarter inch maple floor uh, on top. The golden oak, golden oak is the stain color. Um, obviously after that they apply the stain, after they apply the stain, game lines, logo, et cetera, et cetera they seal it and finish it. Um, and then they install the wall base around the perimeter and it does have a one year warranty on the floor. 
and you can see from the illustration illustration on the bottom side of it not only on the right hand side but you can see that's quite a that's quite a system th that goes into to installing a gym wood floor it'll be finished um, before school starts completely finished okay. before school starts that is the goal that is the absolute goal Contract. and I've got some <laughs> estimates um, from really all parties involved and they adding up all of their estimates should be able to be done start to finish in two months so if they stick to that we would anticipate um, a June 4th start date and we've had some discussions with Chopticon High School to allow us to have access to the gym to get that started so if that's the case by August 4th we should be in good shape and they did say uh, the flooring company especially did say um, as we progress if it looks like we're not going to hit deadlines Sunday Saturdays and Sundays are they are open to doing whatever they have to do to meet the deadline so um, again beginning in early June so the, the, the bleachers will be removed and discarded once the flooring com project project is complete the new bleachers will be installed uh, that has 1383 seats <clears throat> there are three banks of uh, three banks of bleachers this is the model maxim uh, and the seats it gives you the dimensions of the seats and how many rows um, the prior set of bleachers I don't know if, if you've attended the game there you know that that first row is right on the court not it's really wasn't a, a safe situation so that's been addressed uh, in the plans for these bleachers uh, and they do come uh, with a five-year warranty as you can see in the illustration here are the colors that were chosen um, black for the actual seats and you can see the courtside XC 10 those would be black uh, the deck is gray and then the the rails um, that you can see in the illustration are black in the illustration those would all be red um, and these are individual defined seats which I think is kind of a nice feature too you know when you have a a wooden bleacher you know however many people you can squeeze in you try to squeeze in so you do have an individual seat with this model of, of seat so Mastercare Flooring it's a Baltimore based company that has serviced the Mid-Atlantic region for 30 years they've done a lot of work for us uh, they've done a lot of work really all over and here here are some a few names that you'll recognize and work that they've done Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum the Department of Navy um, Hard Rock Cafe not that anybody's playing basketball in the Hard Rock Cafe but um, United States Secret Service the White House so a reputable company obviously um, they perform work for us uh, 2008 Chopticon High School the floor replacement and then the Spring Ridge Middle School gym floor replacement in 2014 and of course they do various repairs line installation and finish uh, finishing installations and repairs for us so TJ distributors they're Forest Hill Maryland company formed in 95 they serve Delaware District of Columbia Maryland and Virginia they've worked hand-in-hand -hand with Mastercare flooring on m multiple projects so they 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 interact with each other and they plan with each other so sometimes they don't they, they kind of can operate and take care of logistics outside of us having to be involved so that's a plus a um, couple of jobs that they've done um, bleachers at Haverty Grace Middle and High School in Haverty Grace Crofton High School in Gambrels Spotsylvania High School in Spotsylvania you can see the pictures of some of their work there in Longwood University in Farmville um, they they've been doing athletic in installations repairs and inspections for us since 2009 so we use them we use them for our inspections and all kinds of repair work uh, part of part of it's separate from this while this is all going on we are um, we are going to try to find funding to do to paint so because when we pull the bleachers out we expect that there's going to you know there's going to be some issues there so we want to paint at least halfway up that black and red um, and then also repair the the divider that's in the, the gym it doesn't go all the way up now and I think periodically it interferes with volleyball so we do have an estimate that, that red net to, yeah, to get that repaired so that it operates completely and then it goes it retracts completely so that's part of the part of the project and so our recommendation is that the Board of Education approve this agenda item as presented I have a question okay. yeah actually um, so like as of current since the child's bleachers like kind of come out all the way as we kind of talked about 
and this would resolve that issue. Is it going to change the like amount of seating that's in the gym? Yeah, I think when all said and done, I think it reduces. Well, it's really hard, right? The estimate is the estimate. It depends on. I mean, it's a bench now, so how many people can you squeeze in? But yeah. I think it was actually around fourteen hundred, and I think it goes to what did I say? Seventeen or uh, thirteen eighty three. So really, in the long run, you lose about seventeen. I think it's seven, like seventeen. It's not. It's not a big loss. It's not a big loss. Okay. And it, and because it was backed up, mm -hmm. they are also well, do go a little bit higher. Oh, okay. To a, to kind of take up some of that loss. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And then after that, I just wanted to say um, thank you because I have played many a basketball game in this gym, and <laughs> it is the floor is dead. <laughs> really weird. It's yeah. Dead. There's, it's, there's so many dead spots on it. Yep. And so yeah, thank you for replacing. Have it. Have you ever had to dive over the players' bench? <laughs> <laughs> um. Probably, actually, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but yeah, probably at some point. I have no questions, thank you. So. Well, I was just gonna say the kids were gonna really enjoy having it, but uh, you've already contested <laughs> to that, so good job, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, okay, so here's, all right, you know, like, Chopticon apparently is like just sinking because everything's underwater, right? We had the problem with the football field, then we have the problem with the softball field. Oh, field. So. How do we know, if, now that we're gonna tear up this floor, that wherever the water is coming from and wherever, however it's pooling under there, that it's, all, that it's going to be corrected? So where are we? Like, where are my engineers? <laughs> not, not that I don't trust you two, but. <laughs> no, I, I, um, so where we think the water was coming from, being across the, the courtyard there, like we have, uh, maintenance has taken all the trees out of there. They did scope the, the drains to make sure the drains in that courtyard were flowing appropriately. They addressed the side of the, the courtyard there where the water was coming through, like through the doors or, or through the wall. Um, that, that situation has been addressed, and that's, that's the water that we can point to. That's okay. the water that we know that we physically have seen, that we know that we have addressed. Um, things coming up from underneath and, and potential like that, with, once we get to the sub sub floor of the concrete, we won't know until we get down there if there's issues there. Okay, so then is the contingency, mm -hmm. I mean, then, is the $49,000 in, can I mean, because we blew through the contingency for the turf fields pretty much all on Chopticon. So would that then be enough or we, we're just best guessing it right now? That's the contingency is the, the money left over based on what we were given in okay. fund balance. So like I said, that we're more comfortable with a, a kind of a 12%, um, but we could easily blow through that too, depending on what issues might be there. Okay. And we've had our own guys and a, uh, third-party vendor in that steam tunnel um, mm -hmm. to investigate to take humidity readings and all that and they've assured us that that is okay that the moisture readings in there will not cause us a problem um, and then of course as Mike said the flooding in the courtyard you know right. those trees were dropping you know all kinds of things that were clogging the drain and right. then it was running across the hallway that's been solved and the trees are gone um, and we've had some pretty substantial uh, rain since that's all been removed, right. which is great, because um, that you know that was one of the worries, right? Have we eliminated it? And it appears that with the amount of rain that we've had, that it looks like it's been it's been eliminated. Yeah. Now trees, environmentalists won't be happy, but you're saving the gym floor. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Mary. Thank you. I had the same question um, um, Mr. Davis had and Mrs. <coughs> Bailey had about. Um, the flooding and addressing that. So I thank you for bringing this forward. And then we have equity among all the high schools regarding their gym floors. That number one is safe for the students to play on. So I think it's great. So it needed to be done. Uh, picture taken way back when. That was, that was September of 2019. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and Mr. Sapp was sitting there because it was senior night for our seniors. So they didn't want to shorten the volleyball court and do it, you know, this way and you know so it's definitely a safety issue so that will be addressed thank you and thank you. the flooding so was it necessary um in the courtyard to put any additional drains in french drains anything like that along the uh, foundation of the building to deal with any runoff or any water yeah I mean it, it honestly it just it appears that it, it was just clogged with all of the debris from it. it everything that's there seems to be sufficient now okay and, and and as I said before the 
fortunately, we have had some substantial downpours, and we, we actually captured on security video, we could see the water running across the hallway, you know, after a rainstorm. So it was pretty evident that that was the main culprit. Okay. Um, you know, and since then, I mean, we, we feel like it's been, it's been addressed. Okay. And of course, as you can imagine, the, that courtyard is surrounded on all four sides by building. That would be right. a massive task to, I know. to have to. Just ask. <laughs> nope, nope. You know, it's a worst case scenario is um, we have not found all of the sources of the water and um, that the floor, it, we're not going to be able to put it back down until we accomplish that. So um, hoping that the contingency is sufficient, that the issue has been adequately identified and addressed, and that we can move forward with this project. So um, my questions have uh, all been asked and answered. Thank you very much. I have, I have one more question. Um, so you mentioned a crawl space, like under the gym floor. Was it under the gym floor? Is that going to affect, like, digging into the floor, like, at all? Is No. No. It's, no. Like, too far away? No, it's, like, it's, it's far beneath the playing well. surface. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's it. All right. Okay, so... I am proposing on the board docs. We're going to have to. We're going to break this into three motions right. because we have we have two different contracts, mm -hmm. and then just so everyone understands, the construction contingency of the forty nine six thirteen is going to, will be for either of the two contracts, right. okay? That we are going to approve. So I need three separate motions. So if actually, can you go back one slide, yep. please? Uh, to keep going. Where's the one that you had the? Do we have the? Nope. I swear. Where did I see it? Oh, yeah. This is the one. Yeah, introduction, that one. So those really are going to be our three motions. Okay? Okay. So whoever wants to go. I move that the Board of Education approve an award to Master Care Flooring Incorporated a contract in the amount of $231,487 for for the replacement of the gym floor at Shaftakan High School. Perfect. All right. So that was Mary. Now I need a second. Second. A second. All right. We got Dorothy. Jim, hang on. Okay. <laughs> so all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Number two. <laughs> Keep going. I Mary. move that the Board of Education approve an award to TJ Distributors Incorporated a contract in the amount of $293,000 $900 for the Chaptacon, uh, for the replacement of the bleachers in the gym at Chaptacon High School. All right, now I need a second. I second. All right, Jim, gotcha. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now, tricky, because I need the contingency for both of the two. Um, would you like me to do that one? Yeah, you can. You can. <laughs> I move the board request a construction con approve a construction contingency of $49,613 on the entire renovation project for flooring and bleachers at Chopticon High School. Perfect. All right, may I have a second? Second. All right, Dorothy. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, you're good. Thank all right. You. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Kim. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, who do I have? Ms. Dvorak. Hello. And team. And team, yes. And team. Good morning. Should I wait a moment? Good morning. Good morning. She'll be, she'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> 
So thank you so much for having us here. I know at the last board meeting on January 25th, Ms. Bachner presented some very exciting Dibbles data um, to show that we really are moving in the right direction, especially when we're looking at our earliest learners. And so we are asked here today just to kind of give a background on really what has culminating has culminated in that. And it really has been a ton of work over the past three to four years and it hasn't been the work of one person um, or one project or one program or one training. Um, there really has been a lot that has gone into it. Um, so I am here with our wonderful ELA team and I'm going to give them a moment to introduce themselves. So I am Courtney Dvorak. I am the supervisor of instruction for elementary ELA mm -hmm. and we have Kelly Hall, lead interventionist. Mary Pat Smith, literacy coach. Jamie Pepper, supervisor of instruction for my elementary programs. And I promise you if any of these ladies left me, I would be lost <laughs> and we wouldn't be where we are. All right. Okay, so first we wanted to share our universal screening process with you all. Um, in 2019, the Ready to Read Act required that all Maryland school districts screen students in grades K through three for reading difficulties, including dyslexia. And lucky for us, we had already been doing that with Dibbles. Um, so, and we continue to do that with Dibbles 8, um, screening students in grades K through 5 um, three times a year, which is more than is required by the Ready to Read Act. So once we have that screening completed, um, the, the ELA team identifies students who could may be at risk for reading difficulties. Um, we use the Dibbles percentile rankings and we make lists of those students and send them out to schools. Um, the schools um, send um, parent notification letters to parents, letting them know that their child could be at risk for reading difficulties. Um, that letter includes um, the supplemental instruction that those students will receive. Um, and also, um, it also, um, we also have progress monitoring. So whatever supplemental instruction that the student is receiving, that is progress monitored to make sure that they are headed in the right direction with that instruction. And if they're not, then we make changes along the way. Um, the parents are also notified um, quarterly through the report cards um, of their child's progress in that supplemental um, in that supplemental instruction. So that's the universal screening process that kind of gets everything started. And so like Jamie had said, we luckily were ready to go. When the Ready to Read Act was um, made into law, we really had a solid foundation. I mean, there are some districts who were still trying to identify a universal screener. And like, I, like you all know, we've been using Dibbles probably for the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. We just didn't know what to do with that data or really what it was telling us, to be honest. Um, so honestly, this started when Dr. Montgomery came into my office five o'clock one evening and said, there's probably a meeting you should be at tomorrow at like 7 a.m. Can you be here? And I was like, well, I can't say no to you. So yes, 100%. Um, and so we really started with our work with the National Center on Improving Literacy, and that all stemmed from Dr. Smith's work with the Dyslexia Task Force and MSDE. And from about 2018-2020, uh, we were very, very blessed to have the opportunity um, to work with some experts in the field of reading um, and reading research, and they really helped us understand what that data was telling us. Um, and from there, we got the idea, we got a grant through MSDE where we could form what we call universal screening teams. And it really did start as representatives from every school, so K through two teachers, a special education teacher, maybe instructional resource teacher. I have a feeling all three of you probably served on your school's universal screening team yes. at the time. Um, and we would have half day sessions where te teams came in and we'd really just talk about the data, what all of those measures meant. Um, from there, so we did that for a couple of years and I think we got a good um, handle on, okay, what is it telling us? Um, but we knew that we need to move forward with that next question. Okay, so what, what happens next? So now that we know this, what do we need to do? And so one of the amazing things that happened with COVID was the ability to meet virtually instead of everyone together. We now got to meet virtually with individual school teams and really then instead of, and hone in on school data instead of district data, really. Um, so we transitioned to that, um, had some better conversations at the school level, um, but then eventually um, we decided um, 
when we were back in person, we really shifted to instead of the universal screening teams, shifting and meeting with every grade level team of teachers and to provide some um, guidance to them. And so we got to provide some general grouping guidance for kiddos. Um, but then the question was always like, what does that instruction look like? What, what do I need to do in my classroom? And so this year we really have refined our universal screening teams to be more targeted on what should be happening in those small groups um, and really building the capacity of our teams to try to um, move forward without us eventually. Um, so in your folders, we just wanted to share some resources um, that we've been um, have created. And when I say we, um, a lot of it has really been Kelly, Kelly. Paul, okay. <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, and it started with the one on top, which was um, the decision tree. So like I said, I mean, we looked to, you know, really looking at this data um, pretty broadly, and then we wanted to drill down to, okay, so if we're seeing kids who look like this, what is that next step? And so really thinking about next steps. And so we would have kind of like these conversations with teams, which were great, um, but we were just kind of leaving them with like these next steps to think about. And there really wasn't any action, or there may have been action, but there wasn't always a strong understanding of what that action should be. Um, so then we developed the grouping worksheets, which is that second document, that really aligned well with our decision trees. And so at the end of a meeting, we actually had students' names on papers as to what targeted small group do you need and what skills does that targeted small group need to um, focus on in order to move you up on that continuum of foundational reading instruction. Um, but that still wasn't enough because we hadn't answered the question of like, well, what does that look like? Um, and so that is that um, small group guidance document that is in there where we really, and this was a huge team effort. I think we spent two or three days just in our office um, really knocking this out. Um, and based on all of the instructional materials we have in St. Mary's County and all of the good instructional um, evidence-based practices, really tried to give teachers a very clear understanding of if your kid is presenting like this, here are some good instructional um, practices that you, should, you could employ during your small group instruction. Um, so it really was a labor of love. So is this, may I ask a question? Of course. Oh, okay, thank you. So the sheet right here, the second sheet, uh -huh. where it says warning. Yes. So this is for each student. They get this, and this is like testing to see where they are. So that would oh, be yeah. each classroom teacher would fill that out for their student, for their class. Oh, for this. So class. they would kind of okay. know um, group as one a whole. as a whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are my kids in group one, here are my kids in group two, and in that group five, we put that warning in there, especially because okay. it's mid-year, and we really want to pay super close attention to those kids and make sure that we're doing what, what they need. Yep. And then the small group guidance document mirrors perfectly the grouping worksheets that we created. So you can see if it's group one for, um, I think you're, you guys have second grade, mm -hmm. um, we gave group one guidance in that small group document as well. So. Um, one of the other things that has been helpful too is with the grouping worksheets, um, we could help identify students who might be good candidates to work with our literacy intervention um, teachers um, or literacy intervention assistants. And I'm going to pass it on to Kelly to talk about that. So one of the things that I was tasked to do, besides Lisa Bachner telling me we needed a flow chart and that's yes. how we got our decision tree. Um, once we had students who were identified, and it was in 2019, the fall of 2019, when we got started, um, the idea was we were going to hire some folks to provide some intervention support in the elementary schools. And we got um, s hired several interventionists, got them started in January, <laughs> and then COVID <laughs> happened. And our interventionists were brave and returned and continued to provide intervention support virtually to students. <laughs> um, based on the Dibbles data that we had and student need and um, so we've been working since that time with groups of interventionists we've had anywhere from 10 to 14 at different times in the last several years who've been supporting kids and in when we first started in um, school year 1920 we worked with 128 students 
and these are folks who worked only half days so across the county and in, in about eight or nine different schools they worked with 128 students in the 2021 school year we were up to 209 students who were supported during the school year in 2022 we were up to 500 students that received intervention support during the school year across our elementary schools. And this year in 2023, in November, we've already worked with over 200 students. And right now, this year, that is only 10. We are down to 10 interventionists right now. They are spread across 11 schools. I have one who does morning at one school and afternoon at another. Um, so they are spread out. When we started, the first thing that we did was provide really, really solid training on the science of reading. What we know works with students. We're not gonna go into schools and practice ABCs with kids, and we're not gonna go into schools and read them stories. We're gonna go into schools and use research-based interventions that are targeting the skills that we know we're missing because we have the data. We're gonna do progress monitoring so that after nine weeks, we know if those kids are moving forward or not. And we're gonna change the intervention if it's not working because there's no point in wasting anyone's time if we're not moving these kids ahead. So it's been very targeted. We, the interventionists go to the schools on Monday through Thursday to work with groups of students. On Fridays, we convene usually at the tech center. Um, we do professional development because half of our interventionists are retired, mostly retired teachers who still have their Maryland certification. The other half are community members who really wanted to contribute and thought that this was a good way. All of them are incredibly positive. Um, I've had one say, this is the best job I've ever had. So, um, and this is definitely what I plan to do when I retire too. <laughs> so, um, it is a meeting where we problem solve when, when we have concerns about students, where we learn new things that are being discovered in research because that is ongoing, which means reading instruction will always be changing. Now that we can do fMRIs and see what kids' brains are doing, reading instruction will always be changing, hopefully always getting better. Um, so it's been an incredibly exciting time. Um, yeah, and, and just really well supported by our school communities, our, our school folks seem to be really appreciative of the work that we're doing. As always, the more hands you can get to do that heavy lift is really, really helpful. But it's very data-driven, very focused, and because of that, I think anytime you have data and you can see that growth in the data, it's incredibly encouraging. And what we know too is early intervention is key. So our leaders really work with our K-1-2 students. Um, more first and second at the beginning of the year and as soon as we get that mid-K data, um, we transition them. And you can see this is a quote from one of them who uh, sent Kelly an email and I left the student's name out, but we had a kid who started in phonemic um, awareness group and then moved to a foundations group and then is now score or core on dibbles. So it did exactly what it was supposed to do for that kid. Um, so Kelly really handles all of the early intervention and support and then we have Mary Pat um, who is our instructional or literacy coach who really focuses on that good solid tier one instruction. Yeah. So um, I really focus on teachers and what their instruction looks like. Um, the Dibbles and the UST meetings really determine uh, where mm -hmm. I go and who I'm working with. Um, so for right now, support can look very different. Sometimes I'm going into schools and it's just a quick modeling and working with teachers for a few weeks. Um, I'll pop in, I do informal observations and it's feedback, um, and we go back and forth to make some tweaks. Other times I kind of park myself at a school with a team for a while and we work. Um, we have data meetings, we're really delving in, looking at kids, um, starting to move into some co-teaching. So I'll come in and model and then I'll work and stay with that teacher and we'll co-teach for a while together. And then we look at data again after progress monitoring and figure out what tweaks need to be made next. So. Um, the coaching looks different depending on what the data says. So, um, but really what we've found has been successful so far is that when the coaching and the professional development that teachers are getting is continuous, that's when we're seeing the most growth. So when it's a one and done type thing, it's beneficial, but not as much growth as it could be. So. Um, if you look at the data that's just kind of marked here, this is a kindergarten team I worked with. Um, 
last year. Yeah, I mean, yep. this at least six weeks. I think yeah. we were close to nine to 10 weeks that we were working together. And it started out just as me attending their PLC meetings and then moving into some co-teaching uh, <coughs> as we went through the year. But if you look at their beginning of the year, Dibble's data, they had 45% of their kindergartners intensive. Um, Mid-year was 37% intensive. And then by the end of the year, they had 17% of their kindergartners intensive on Dibbles, which is massive, massive growth. And it's not because I was there, that wasn't the point. The point was that we had constant collaboration and discussions and tweaks and instructional discussions. And when you have the opportunity to do that with teachers, kids move because it's someone else that's there supporting um, that can really make sure kids are getting the targeted stuff that they need. Because it's a lot on a teacher's plate every day, so. Now, when those students go into first grade, do you test them right off the bat? Because I know reading during the summer is important. So do you, this group that you worked with, yeah, they will test them? The following year, the, when they do dibbles again for the beginning of the year, we have that data. So we can kind of see where they left off, okay. and then we can see where they kind of fell for the beginning of the next school year. And what we found this year is our case students from last year moving into first grade really did pretty well stick to where they were at the end of last. So, I mean, we had a couple uh, um, kind of moved back, but we were pretty happy with our beginning of the year first grade results. Um, so as Mary Pat was saying too, so much of it, of the work is, is really behind that professional development that you can have with teachers. And so I won't spend too much on this because I know um, you are all very familiar with the training we've been doing um, in the science of reading, including letters. Um, we just, trained our paraeducators, our leaders, and all of our teacher apprentices, a um, hundred of them, in um, an overview of the science of reading through the 95% group. But then we also have a really good follow-up um, opportunities in PLCs to continue that work because it can't just be that one and done. Um, so this is just a really quick overview of really where letters training started. We started with it in 2020. Um, Mary Pat was one of the original ones that took it when MSD offered it. Another really good thing that came out of COVID was there was all this extra money. Um, so MSD is like, oh, let's look into this letters training. Um, so we sent Mary Pat and she came back and she's like, this is, this is what we need. And I said, okay. Um, so we have currently trained 277 members of our staff. In letters and let me just let I, it's worth there's two volumes one through four and five through eight um, each volume is six credits so one credit is 15 hours so one through four teachers are putting 90 hours outside of their duty day if they also get five through eight that's 180 total hours that they are dedicating to their own professional development that is a lot of time yes yeah. And it has been 100% voluntary, and so I feel like having close to 300 teachers who have done that is pretty significant. Yep. Um, and then this is just from um, the one-day training we just did, and here are our wonderful paraeducators just really engaged in some great work in the science of reading, and we've received fantastic feedback from that. One of the participants said, you know, I've been here for 26 years, and this experience really was in the top five. Um, the professional developments that I've ever received. Um, so in addition to everything, so our work with universal screening teams, everything we know about the science of reading, we have really shifted what that ELA instruction should look like in classrooms. And you have with you our literacy instruction overview, which we developed, I think, last year. Um, and really trying to focus on those big three is our number one goal is to teach kids how to read and write because they're not going to go anywhere without those mm -hmm. skills. Um, and then we also know that we have to do build their background knowledge and their vocabulary because once they have mastered those foundational <coughs> skills, we know that background knowledge and vocabulary play a significant role in reading comprehension. So trying to put our focus there. And then no matter what level a student is on, making sure that we're giving them opportunities to access and listen to grade level um, texts and respond to that either through conversations or writing with their peers. Um, so we've made some significant um, shifts in how we're spending our instruction. We have 135 minutes of ELA instruction. It is not balanced K through five where we spend that time. So for example, um, K through one, they spend 50 minutes of their day on foundational reading skills now. 
Um, and so we just wanted to end with a little bit more Dibbles data for you. So we set a goal as an ELA team three years ago that they laughed at me and they're like, we're never going to meet this, um, to decrease the number of students scoring intensive on Dibbles by 20%. So you can see um, in K through three on those foundational reading skills specifically. So we started with 43, almost 44% and we are down to like 31%. Um, so hopefully we'll make it this year, we'll make that SLL. Um, but I think having that much of increase in such a short, or decrease in such a short amount of time um, is pretty amazing. And then if we drill down to just our K-1 students, where we know a lot of that early intervention is happening, we are almost at that goal. We have almost decreased the number of intensive um, by 20%. Um, and three, that, was, that was the end of last year, yeah. so that was just in two years, which is pretty fantastic. What if we took that, that same graph and then went back 10 previous years? How did that data look? Was it? It was pretty Stagnant. It was flat, right? Yeah, I mean, it was like flat. we have not, we yeah. have not, we have been, we have been using dibbles mm -hmm. forever to get the same, pretty much the same result from dibbles, and it really is with this ridiculous amount of of talent and time and truly treasure that, I mean, I've we everybody who we've ne we never see that we never we haven't really seen a dramatic track like this this is this is fantastic news because this is also the health of our entire school system is predicated on our children you know being able to read and mm -hmm. learn to read and read to learn right mm -hmm. and for the first time ever we have just amazing data and when somebody goes well how did that happen you know <laughs> this is how that happened and just but we're also, I mean, we're, it's not just the K through three that we're seeing that impact. So if we look at our accuracy rates in grades four to five, and we definitely shift looking at Dibbles. It used to all, we used to always look at that oral reading fluency rate, like how many words they were reading per minute mm -hmm. as kind of the benchmark. And once we started shifting to, well, how accurate are they <laughs> when they're reading? Um, you can see, I mean, in 2018, 19, our accuracy rates um, Forty-four percent of our kids were scoring intensive, and we are down to seven four. Mid-year was ten percent, six percent. So they might be slow, but they're accurate. And we know that um, in order to understand what they're reading, kids need to read at about a ninety-five, ninety-eight yeah. percent accuracy rate. So, um, so we're we're getting there. Um, but what's next? So. Um, we're not anywhere close to where we want to be. Um, research shows that 95% of all humans have the cognitive ability to learn how to read. And we know that with um, the RTI triangle, if, if what we're doing in tier one instruction is working, it should serve us about 80% of our kids. 80% of our kids should be 100% on track for where they need to be. We're not there yet. Um, about 15% should be okay with some slight supports and then really only five percent should need some intensive support so our goal really is to get to that 95 percent um, of kids scoring core or strategic on dibbles and only having about five percent in intensive so we're going to keep going we're going to keep going and we have a lot of good things um, in place i think our universal screening team meetings have really evolved beautifully and we've built a lot of teacher capacity to continue that we're looking into something through the maryland leads grant called mclaf class which actually takes our UST meetings and puts it on steroids where like group <laughs> students for us and then gives teachers like lesson plans of like here here you go do this um, so we're looking into that um, expanding our training in the science of reading but I also need to point out that everything that we have done so far has been grant funded yeah. um, so these two ladies are grant funded um, funding for universal screening team stipends for teachers to do all that work so you know just keeping that in mind I think we've used our money well um, and we're very lucky to have it and the other thing too is it's not one single program it really is the amount of training that we've been able to um, yes. give to our teachers um, has been huge so because programs don't teach kids teachers, teachers do, do. <laughs> yes. and that is that's our, sh our spiel. Thanks for listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Um, I don't have any questions, but I apologize because this might be a little bit lengthy. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much because 
um, I don't know, like, I remember taking the doubles test, you know, <laughs> I talked about this the, the last meeting, too, but, like, we really were just, like, racing to, mm-hmm. like, read as many words as we could, and I bet you I read it, like, super wrong, but I was just like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so many words, I'm so goaded, like, wow, like, yeah, that, that's really what it was. We had no idea what it meant. We really didn't know if it was doing anything. Um, I think I was reading a story about like a duck or something. I don't know. I just, that was completely, like I'm sure it had a purpose, but like I'm so glad that we're using it for improvement now and um, that we're really seeing results because, um, I don't know, reading is just one of those things that can cause kids so much distress if they're having trouble with it at an early age. Um, like I remember so many of my classmates and um, they would just, you know, they just get frustrated because maybe they couldn't get through something, you know, as quickly as they had wanted to or, um, you know, maybe we had to popcorn read in class and that was a stressful experience. And, um, you know, that's the time period when we're all figuring out, oh wow, like other people are different than me and how should I feel about that? And um, we were actually talking about this in my psychology class yesterday. Um, about this stage of you know our our social development, and it's like really important that um, we support our students through that experience, and that they have um, you know a positive environment around them, supporting them towards that improvement. Because absolutely, they can you know get better at reading, and they can um, improve. It's just important that we support them, and um, I, I don't know. I'm just so glad that this is. Um, going well and uh, it's also just incredible to see how many teachers have um, uh, went through the letters training Mm -hmm. you know voluntarily and that just um, kind of reinforces the idea that our educators especially those you know um, kindergarten first grade second grade fundamental educators are so important in um, you know making the rest of a a person's life because Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where I would be without you know my pre-k teacher my kindergarten teacher and um, I still remember them, and I still remember, you know, the, you know, our small group lessons, and um, even though it's been, you know, 12 years <laughs> since then, and I don't know, this is just, it's a very, very near and dear topic to my heart because um, I believe that every kid should um, be given the support they need to mm-hmm. learn to read. So yeah, reading is thinking, thinking is learning, learning is awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's the key. That's what we always say to the fifth grade when we're talking. Yes, we do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, great work. You know, t- teachers, in my mind, uh, first line of defense, and um, reading and learning are tied inexorably together. Uh, so. I, I was heartened to hear how you're diagnosing these problems for a lot of kids. And it reminds me of uh, the Leonardtown Alliance Club. One of the things that they do is they look at uh, visual acuity and audit- auditory deficiencies <clears throat> in young children. What was really surprising was how many that we found of kids that had uh, sight problems or hearing problems that their parents or the teachers didn't know Mm -hmm. and we were able to you know to get uh, proper direction so uh, just kudos to you guys for uh, working with these kids because learning and is uh, is tied to to reading If you can't read you're not going to learn very much and uh, the reason I know that is that my grandmother who was a librarian used to send me books when I was a young kid and I never read them. So I was kind of slow on the uptake in terms of learning. <laughs> so I've got a couple of questions just to help me understand. Now, first one, I don't need really an understanding about, but is it for all the schools? Is Chesapeake Charter School also mm-hmm. doing this? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. So in the groups, are they... Uh, just say there's only two that needed like extra work. Are they put to another part of the classroom to you know do extra work with? Are they put into another room? How does that work? I'm sorry, I just I, when well, you're doing the group to yeah. try to improve in the areas that they seem to need. Built into our 135 minute reading block is time for targeted small group 
instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and that time really is meant to be um, differentiated based on student needs. Now different schools have different models of what that uh, could look like. Um, some teachers handle all of their kids on their own, where some other um, grade levels might flex across the grade level. So if um, I know that you know, all of these kids really need help with blending, then we'll take all the kids from every room and they'll come to mine and we'll really target it that way. So it really depends on the, on the school, but we do have built-in time within our ELA block to give that differentiated targeted instruction. And is that daily? It, or, yeah. Okay, so it's daily. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. They, when they, because when they do, okay. when they do, Probably when they do English that. language arts in elementary school, so they have, you know, all the children are broken up into groups, like you know, like my kids' teacher. She used sports teams. So there was the Eagles. There was you know the Cowboys. There was the uh, Commanders, or you know there was the Ravens, and then that was their reading group that then they okay. worked with okay. during that that block period. Mm -hmm. So I think. The, this chart here. The materials that you is, have right. show so exactly these are how we group the different groups. and exactly so how we provide then, intervention. Then they, they have a, you know, then if they need extra help or assistance from them, then they can forward this paper back to Ms. Dvorak's team and then they can, you know, help the teacher get additional interventions if they need it for that particular group, right? Yes, it's, yeah. yeah. And um, I don't know if this is helpful, helpful Mrs. Andrews, but like, um, like when I was in elementary school, we'd do like rotations. So each group would have a set amount of time with uh, their teacher in their small group, and then everyone else would be working on something independently, and then we'd switch, and then another group would go, and then, you know, it, it's that's kind of how we got through. Yeah. Every group got to meet with the And it's been a common practice. I'll say what has changed with small, is small group instruction is really the focus of mm -hmm. it, where we used to level our kids um, with some arbitrary numbers or letters or whatever system we were using um, and then really focus on reading comprehension we're now really using the data to say okay what, what reading skills do our students need and so that's the focus of our small group instruction now so and then in that nine week I know I have a lot of questions <laughs> so that nine week period do the parents hear feedback how their child is doing how can they help at home do you want to take that one Jim I think yeah, yeah I mean I think I mean or is it continual conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the normal the, the normal channels that teachers communicate with parents, you know. Um, I'm definitely like, you know, the report cards and things like that and any kind of updates or what the, whatever system the teacher has in place for communicating that growth or what's happening in the groups with the parents. Yeah. I mean, you just don't as a parent want to have the report card and then see how, I'm not going to use it, uh, how much help they really needed. You know, that that's a long time period yeah, to I, where, I, well, I think, you know, half So part of it is, too, I think we probably, so keep in mind that all elementary schools have narrative report cards, right? So they're getting multiple times throughout the year where they get very specific feedback from the teachers exactly how their children are doing, and, and it breaks down a great deal of information as well. I know that there are a lot of classroom, daily classroom tools that they use back and forth to communicate with, with parents, and certainly the greatest amount of energy and effort goes into children who find themselves in basically the need for tier three level interventions where it is pretty it, it can be pretty intensive and and then we get into the whole if your child has an IEP or something such as that but I, I think the the largest is to recognize that a lot of if you haven't been in an elementary school <laughs> in the last four years because I'll go so far as like in the you know pre pandemic to now it is it is not the elementary school that you would see five ten fifteen years ago um, it, 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 it absolutely is not and the you know the I think on one of these things it says that uh, teaching is rocket science it is I mean this stuff is the science of reading is absolute brain-based research mm -hmm. science um, and and ultimately what 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 I appreciate most with with the level of talent that we have at central office is that we are consistently making sure that what's happening on one side of the county is happening all the way on the other side of the county and the resources that are available to some are the resources that are available to to all and so what's in this folder and I know that you didn't get this in advance but this folder has an incredible <laughs> amount of information and a roadmap to just to, to give you an understanding of how we're working with each one of each one of our teachers and any parent that wants to come in and engage in a, in a conversation about this work, I know that that's a, that's a fairly welcomed uh, uh, parent. 
um, to really talk about what their child is, you know, doing well in, and what they're. I mean, that's that's the that's the basis for the relationship between a parent and uh, a, a classroom teacher. And parent-teacher conferences are are most utilized um, by parents at the elementary level, um, significantly so. I will tell you that we used to have um, parents would come in after at the end of each marking period and at the end of the year saying I had no idea that my child wasn't doing well in school I have no idea why they failed this course nobody <laughs> told me um, that uh, we haven't fielded a question like that in years and years and years because there is, there are a lot of tools to help parents understand exactly how their children are doing and there's a lot of capacity to engage in a conversation as to how um, they can help support at home and extend learning and, and things and things such as that. So, um, and again, the, and the proofs in the pudding, as it were. Um, there's really this is really fantastic data. We're coming out of a pandemic. While the rest of the world is talking about the fact that this is a gap, these kids will never make up. This is going to be they're 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 kind of spooling out this tragic tale that I don't think is demonstrated by the actual work of people in classroom with kids and the data that's coming out. I think there are certainly gaps that need to be filled, but there are definitely practices in place in St. Mary's County that show we are on a very good path. Yes. And a lot of teachers communicate with um, their students' parents or guardians. Um, on a regular basis, like I remember when I was in elementary school, again, this is very dated, which is crazy because I'm only 17, but whatever. Um, it's, uh, we had like a folder that we would take home every day and the teacher would like write a little update, you know, about your learning every day and then they'd hand the paper back to you, you'd put it in your folder, they'd be like, you're gonna take this home to your mom tonight, right? And I'd be like, yeah. And so then I'd have to give it to my mom, my mom would have to like sign it, you know, to uh, acknowledge that she'd read it, whatever updates my teacher had given her, and then, I take it back to school the next day, and so there was kind of there are a, a lot of um, you know communication systems in place between teachers and families. So, yeah. well, I look forward to continuing to hear updates because it's improved so much. You know, get, you set a good goal. Well, I love the fact that we are now in aspiring, so challenge and support. And I wanted to go back to the because that 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 goal is an aspirational goal. <laughs> um, but that's what you, what, that's what, that's what science tells us. Yeah. If everything was working perfectly, that's, that would be the measured mark we would shoot for. Yes. So, thank you. You are inspiring. Mm -hmm. Mary? Oh. Reading Wait, is, are you done? oh, okay, I'm oh, I'm, I'm sure she was done. Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> reading that's is, no, that's okay. <laughs> Reading is a science, and reading is vitally important to the success of their students today and in the future. And I believe you're going to make that 95% because you're doing so many things. You're doing informal observations. You're doing um, the data dive, co-teaching with the classroom <laughs> teachers, professional development, instructional dialogue. You're doing everything to get the students where they need to be, the amount of testing that you do the many times that you test the students. And I think all of that is good. Um, thank you for staying current on the latest research and reading. Because one thing in education, the norm is change and continuous improvement. Uh -huh. And you're on top of that, and thank you so much for that. I want to thank 277 teachers Absolutely. and congratulate them on taking the training. And it was on a volunteer basis. Yes. They chose to do that, to do what's best for their students, and I appreciate that. And the amount of hours that it takes to do that training, to be proficient in that. So I thank you very much for all that you're doing. And reading is a science. It is a science. It's prescriptive. It's diagnostic. And you come up just like a doctor. You go take the test, you evaluate the results, and you come up with a prescription. This is what we need to do to work on whatever thing you have. Mm -hmm. And they do that. Then they say, come back in three months or a month, <laughs> and then we're going to test you again. We're going to reweigh you, Scott, so we're coming back. So you better eat your salads. Yes, yeah, yes. and then you do it again, and you do it again, and you educate 
so that everybody will get where they need to be. So thank you, and I know you'll reach the 95% goal. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love yeah. I love the flow charts, um, Ms. Yeah. Paul. Thank you very much. Um, you. I, you know the the ability to really, um, you know, not just look at what a child is doing, evaluate what a child is doing, but then really have that flow chart to go. Okay, where am I here? Um, because every child is different, and so knowing where you're going to capture them along the flow chart, um, at least for me, would be uh, extremely helpful. Um, a friend of mine uh, is one of those retired teachers who mm -hmm. is one of your literacy intervention teachers, and um, and she is just over the moon about um, the opportunity to continue working with students. I know she's always pitching it to people. Um, and hoping that they will have an opportunity to come on board and do this um, because of how rewarding it is um, and how it really lets her focus on you know her training and then just with those particular students really um, having a hands-on approach to um, making a significant change in the lives of these children um, so our literacy intervention teachers are in only 11 of our elementary schools how specifically are you supporting the remainder of those elementary schools since um, I know that our struggling readers are not confined to just 11 mm -hmm. elementary schools? I, that really, I think, comes through, um, through our universal screening team meetings and really just providing teachers with the guidance on what to do with the students who are struggling. And so um, most schools have our instructional resource teachers, so those are often um, brought into kind of pool in I wouldn't even say pool intervention groups, but really come in and work with the teachers to help lend that extra support. Um, Jamie or Kelly, Mary Pat, if you have anything to add to that, please do. We How did, did use data when yeah. we were determining which schools yes. would get that intervention support, yeah. and we have shifted it slightly um, over the years as the data has changed. Okay. So we try yeah. to make certain that where the interventionists are, are those schools of greatest need okay. and the yeah. highest numbers of students at risk. Um, in, if we get to our plan where 80% of the class is proficient, then the teacher will be able to provide yeah. intervention for that 20 per, or 15 or so percent. But, but at this time, we're not there. And so yeah. that extra support is really critical. I would love to have someone. My, initially, I told Courtney, I want to have someone at every single school. But that's not been our physical reality right now. We advertise and we find some folks, but then occasionally one will go and do something else, and it's hard. It's been a good springboard for forward movement in our county, too. I mean, we've had some literacy interventionists move on to other positions, mm -hmm. so, right. which has been great. But yeah, if you know seven more people, yes. seven more <laughs> away. You never know where these volunteer <clears throat> opportunities will lead you. Yeah. Because I was a parent volunteer for about seven years, and look where I am now. Well, yeah. and our leaders are and Kathy too. Um, they are employed by Abacus, so they are um, employees again, grant funded. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yep. well, we will hope that um, <laughs> that uh, our wonderful staff can uh, continue to cobble together the needed um, grants. I'm, you know, staring at the other Mrs. Hall, Dr. Yeah. Hall, <laughs> um, knowing that she is likely a part of that process yeah. in um, finding those grant opportunities, and she is very good at it. So um, to all of those who are involved in it, um, very much appreciated because um, at the end of the day, it's our students and our teachers mm -hmm. who are going to benefit from all of this. So thank you. And Mrs. Hall, you read my mind about the data piece because that was my next question. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. Okay, that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and next we have Tammy Burr. And as we move away from elementary and the data that drives a lot of the day-to-day -day instructional decision making, we now roll up into the, the, the state one and done assessments and what that, what that data shows us. Um, this is a little more challenging data because there are, there are, so, many, there are so many things that impact a one and done assessment. 
um, overall where people are on that particular day of the assessment, what's going on within the larger community, the assessment itself. Um, there's, there's, a, there, there's a lot to unpack, and I think that as we move back into a normal operational school year, because keep in mind that the data we're going to look at is from last year, and last year wasn't normal. <laughs> It was more normal than the year before that, but it wasn't a normal school year. So, um, and everybody was working on the same level. So, comparative, the the I think the the greater value is in is in comparing the data um, between what is happening in St. Mary's County and then what's happening across the state. So, with that, Ms. Burr. Well, and uh, as we start, something else to remember is that these were completely new tests. Um, there was no standard. We would, the reason we're getting the data so late is that they spent all summer and fall doing standard setting. So um, one of the first things that I'm going to talk about um, are the new standards. And I don't know why yours aren't progressing here. They had the same problem. Yeah, I don't. My slides are moving. And Mr. Howard left. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Marr. Yeah. Is um, probably somewhere yeah, in the Yeah, well, and this happened before. So <coughs> close close out the whole presentation. Um, are we going to need to restart the, the computer? There's quite a few that were still open behind that. I might be doing it. Yeah. Let's just try it. The yeah, there's files. several up here. Yeah. Yeah. So close all, close everything. But it they won't close. That's the thing. Yeah, the whole system. Yeah, I'm, we're going to need to restart the computer. So we will try again. <laughs> uh, as I was saying, the, it was a completely new test and new standards and new performance levels. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were finishing up park uh, assessments, which had five performance levels. Uh, we didn't test it all in 2020. In 2021, we had the early fall assessment, which was uh, the fall, September, October of 22, was assessments for the 21 school year. And then in the spring of 22 was the first time we had these new uh, ELA and math assessments. And we went from five levels on park to three levels on the early fall. Now we're at four levels. And the four levels have new definitions. So your performance level or descriptions are distinguished learner, proficient learner, developing learner, and beginning learner. So those are the four different levels that will be um, for every student for every MCAP test. Uh, if we're going to look at ELA first, these are straight from MSDE, the scale scores, cut points for performance levels, and you will see across grade levels for the band between one and two and two and three, the numbers are the same that you have, it, it's uh, 625 and 650 to move up. When you get to that distinguished learner level, the scale score numbers are different depending on the grade level and the specific test. When we look at our results, I broke them down by strands, as the state refers to them, and our elementary schools are three, four, and five. So the first set of columns there 
uh, are the state averages. And when the state talks about meeting proficiency, they're looking at that green bar and the blue bar, the students who are proficient or distinguished. They combine those two to talk about the percent proficient. So overall in the state, we had 39% in proficient and 5% in distinguished. So the state would say they had 44% proficient there. So that's when you see the state numbers talk about proficiency that Dr. Smith uh, referenced last week, or last uh, board meeting. So the, we have the state average, the county average, which you can see the county itself is above the state average. And then I broke that down by grade band. So you can see where our third, fourth, and fifth graders all are. Then we will move on to middle school and we're looking at 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Again, our county averages as well as our individual grade bands are on the whole higher than the state average, which again is good. And then our last look is our high school, and this is used for determining, you keep hearing about the college and career readiness standards, especially with Blueprint. This is one of the factors they use to determine college and career readiness for Blueprint is the ELA 10 results. And I put that little sidebar there because at the last meeting, Dr. Smith mentioned how many kids were close. You know, we are this close. Well, right now, the lowest scale score for proficiency level three, which is considered proficient, is 750. If that scale score were lowered just five points to 745, we would go from an average of 60% of our students in the county being proficient to 71% of our students being proficient. <laughs> So that's how that, when you look at those cut scores that we looked at a few slides ago, if that were adjusted just a little bit, it would have a large impact on our percent proficient in the county. And that could be one question. That could be one that, I mean, that with that cut score from 740 to 745 for some assessments, that's missing one question. So if you miss one question, you're out. That's why these cut, that's why they agonized, the state agonized over all these cut scores and going through and I'm sure they had deep rounds with psychometricians going through this and that. I do think the longer, if they would just please stay with this test <laughs> for 10 years, give us 10 years with the exact same test, we would be able to see Scores rise every year, but the state of Maryland continues to modify its assessment year after year after year and then lament the fact that the data that's derived from it seems as though we're struggling to make progress. Um, hopefully this is it. Hopefully this will be the test. In my 32 years, I've seen seven different iterations of assessments. And unfortunately, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, because By the even, way, she's going to steal it. It's, it's even not. this spring, starting right. this spring, we're going for ELA to something that's considered a must answer to continue, which means a student can't skip an answer, skip a question and come back and answer it later. They can come back, but they have to put in some answer before they can continue. And that is in preparation for computer adaptive testing, which when we start talking about math here in a second, this year will be the first year of a completely computer adaptive test for mathematics in grades three through eight in algebra one. And computer adaptive, when you get an answer right, you go, it's, it's you know, if you answer it right, you go here. If you answer it wrong, you go here. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. So this is the scale score, cut points, and performance levels for math, very similar to ELA in that the first three are similar scores, but to get up to that distinguished level, it depends on your specific grade level, what the cut score is to go from pro, um, proficient to distinguished. Our three, four, and five results, elementary for math, uh, again, when you look at the bars on a whole, uh, the county and the individual grade bands, we did better than the state average. Same thing in middle school, six, seven, and eight. Um, now you may wonder, you look, the, the glaring thing, I think when you look at this, uh, I, the St. Mary's County red bars are significantly lower than the state red bar, which is good because those are your lowest level um, learners. 
But eighth grade, you may be wondering, well, why is eighth grade so much lower than the others for six and seven? That's because your most skilled and talented math students don't take the eighth grade math test. They take the algebra test. And you'll see that on the next slide when we look at the algebra scores. Um, on here, continuing what I was saying before, our averages are still higher than the state average, but our middle school bars, we have a lot more green and blue in middle school than in high school, and that is because your strongest, most talented math students are taking the algebra test in middle school, not in high school. So that explains a little bit why the high school numbers look like they're struggling so much. Even with that, again, if we look at the five point difference, to get to a performance level three, you need a 750. If that were dropped to a 745, instead of having 17% proficient, the county would have had 25% proficient. And as Dr. Smith said, especially on the math test, the way the scoring is, you can get some questions are worth one point, some questions are worth multiple points, some questions are multi-part questions, and you have to answer every part of the question in order to get full credit. So it can come down to one question, and that would have been a difference from 17% proficient to 25% proficient. And this is also where I was talking, I would love to say this is gonna be so much better <laughs> in SY23, but again, completely different style of testing that is gonna be new to our students, this computer adaptive testing, where whatever your answer, if you answer question two correctly, that takes you to one question three. If you answer question two incorrectly, it takes you to a different question three. And they have to answer every question. They cannot skip a question. So if a student, we really have to work with our teachers to work with our students, that you have to make your best attempt on every question, but you can't get stuck and stay there because the potential is that you would never see the rest of the questions if you don't do your best and then move on. Uh, the next question. steps. Yeah, we have a question. Oh, question. So when we test our students in the classroom, mm -hmm. We are not testing them on a computer, correct? It's still no, no, no. Some of them are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Some of them are. Yeah. All right, I'm just asking. Yeah. So then, all right, so I just wanted to see if then when they started to take th these tests, whether this is a completely new experience for them to now take an algebra test online as opposed to taking an algebra test in the classroom. No, I mean, that's, okay. one, of the things, that's one of the things that we've been pushing mm -hmm. for is so that we, we are modeling the same thing they're going to see on the assessment in a regular class-based assessment or a county-based okay. end-of-unit assessment. The big thing is is that they will have never experienced a, 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 a computer adaptive test other than the AccuPlacer for the College of Southern Maryland is the only computer adaptive test I think that we, we do um, and we've had wild discrepancies with that because we've seen kids that are taking calculus, pre-calculus in high school, sit for the AccuPlacer and end up in remedial math. Because it, once you answer a question incorrectly, it takes you down an entirely different path and it doesn't allow you to, it, no one's, it's not as though we're all sitting for the same test. Can you go back then? Like if you, like, so if you answer a question, but you just answer it to keep going, how do you mark that to go back? There is an option in this year's MCAP that you can mark a question and go back to it and even change your answer, and that would change your score for that question. However, your path has already been determined. Oh. So you can go back and revisit a question, even change your answer, even get a so different you, score you, you for that know, question. You mark, you mark the wrong answer, you're already going down Correct. the other rabbit hole. And do worked. you know that you've marked a question incorrectly that sends you down that rabbit hole no. or you don't get any you feedback. just yeah. oh lovely. there is no MSD immediate feedback again. No. right no, I, you know and this has been a, this has been a really active conversation that's been going on for years yeah. and in institutes of higher education being led by psychometricians and that's and 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 requiring the investment of billions of dollars into technology so that kids can do all of this so that ai can score your responses so that you know all of this moving away from what had been the traditional model of a paper and pencil test you get to everybody to everybody's taking the same test everybody you know we're all being we're all being assessed using the same instrument 
and that that is going to truly be just something that we talk about back in the way back days and I, I bring that up, like I said, when we look at our results and we all want to do better and everyone is striving to do better, um, the challenges are twofold. One, we just got these results the very end of January. They came out January 27th. And two, not only was the test different for the first time last year, the test is gonna be different in a new way this year. So it's going to be yet another layer of challenge for our students. Um, ELA is not yet computer adaptive. That's supposed to be coming next year. But algebra and math three through eight are completely computer adaptive this year. OK. All right. But just let her finish her last yeah, slide. Yeah, and then sure. we'll go. Okay. Um, as far as next steps, the content supervisors, as well as the school administrators, have access to <coughs> not just the information I shared with you, but breakdowns by um, their school compared to other schools, grade levels, and then even into demographic data. Um, it's by race and ethnicity, by students who get pre and reduced meals, by students who are English language learners. All that information is available to supervisors and to schools. And um, within the next few months, those uh, there'll be more information coming out. We don't have student performance by what's called evidence statements yet. That should be out the end of February, where we'll say these are the specific types of questions that students do well on, and these are the specific types of questions where they struggle. Again, this would have been much more helpful to have had in the fall than to be getting in February, but we will be getting that information by the end of February. Um, and then even though this information is in Pearson Access, it is also being put in the data course in Schoology to be accessible by um, school admin supervisors and then to be shared with teachers at data team meetings. That's what we're asking, that you take this information, you share it with your data team meetings. And we start MCAP starts March. Well, the window. Science, te science testing for five and eight starts in March, March, and then we continue all the way through the end of May with various tests at various grade levels. Busy times in schools. Yeah. Okay, um, so with the computer adaptive tests, <coughs> so like the rabbit hole that it sends you down, is it the same set of questions or type of questions just in a different order or is it like a completely different test essentially does anybody like is that like a well there are banks it? of questions there are banks of questions that and, and which it's never going to be the same test twice okay but there are banks very 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 large banks of questions oh, okay. so people across the state will be getting the same question sometimes not always. Uh -huh. You could have a completely different test than the person sitting beside you, but the bank is the same across the state. Got it. But is the, and piggybacking on this if you don't mind, but if you answer a, t a test question incorrectly, so you don't advance, you're moving to a different question, adaptive suggests <clears throat> then that, that you're going to be given a question that is not as challenging as the question you would have gotten had you gotten that previous question correct. Mm -hmm. Is that the way this goes? The, the goal, as I understand it, is to get everyone to what um, in education leads we call a frustration point. You know, you, you push the student as far as they can go, and then if they get something wrong, you move back just a little bit, and then you try to work up to that point again, and if that's wrong, you move back just a little bit, and you okay. keep trying to move forward. Okay. okay, so that's my, I'm not a psychometrician, but that is my understanding of so the concept. The, the idea is, okay, maybe you didn't understand the question this time, but if we go back yes. just a bit and rephrase it or state it a different way, then um, that may trigger a, a correct response for you and then you can progress is that right. the, okay. you are working toward those same and we were just talking about here the evidence statements mm -hmm. um, that you're going to be working toward the attainment of a specific evidence statement and maybe we need to move back and work you up to it or rephrase it but you're still working toward the, the attainment of the, those skills okay thank you the thing is computer adaptive assessment is incredibly valuable 
in a classroom where instruction is du is directly then delivered afterwards. You can have all of the kids go through it, and you can, again, very similar to Dibbles, at the end of it, you can have a pretty good roadmap of where there are gaps and where there are things such as that. So uh, there is absolutely a place for it. A, a, a high-stake state assessment where they're going to be determining whether or not you're proficient which will then either open or close a pathway to you next year every you know I, there are there are huge there are huge challenges challenges with it and and we're we'll it's not as though we can do anything about it um you know, we used to have, you used to be able to know exactly what the assessments were going to be, approximately how many questions there were going to be, how many questions there were, going to, there were going to be for each standard. So you could actually target when you were talking to kids, you know, this is, this is really important because this constitutes the majority of the content to be covered on the test. Computer adapted, I, I don't even, I don't, I, it's, going to be, it's going to be just a real challenge. But I will tell you, there will be a vendor right behind this to sell us a product that helps us do whatever the next thing is. Then there's gonna be another vendor to come in to sell to, to the state to do this, and there'll be another vendor and another vendor and another vendor. Um, technology is, it, it should always augment education. It should not drive it. And uh, this one, I think it's, it's definitely grabbed the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. right. Anyone else? I took the MSA in third grade. This is a long way from there. Yeah, well, you, you, right, you took a booklet, yeah. and we had all the booklets. They came down from the state, and they were all sealed, and they were all contained until the day of the test. Mm -hmm. And we had all time, and everybody had the whole thing. Everybody got the booklet, and you did the booklet, and you gathered it all back in, and it, yeah. and it worked. Well, but, I mean, some of the kids, I mean, if it's, if it's going to be this way, some of the students just think it's a joke anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, <clears throat> putting so much emphasis on this and then, you know, as, as what the intent is, is to determine whether you're, you're not proficient and, you know, send you on a different pathway course in 10th grade is, is, is I mean, that just, that blows any type of equity argument right out of the water forever, so. Yep. Uh, I have a question. Um, in Algebra 1 results, I noticed there's quite a difference between Leonardtown Middle and Leonardtown High School in terms of proficiency levels. Can you explain why that? That's because your strongest math students, your most talented math students, actually take algebra in middle school. I so see. by the time they get to high school, they're then taking geometry and algebra too. So the, the, those students that we okay. know are doing very well in math take, yeah. it, take algebra in middle school. And Leonardtown Middle School has the highest enrollment of students taking algebra in eighth grade across all four middle schools. So more kids take algebra in Leonardtown Middle School. And then so what you see in, in ninth grade, if you're in a ninth grade algebra on grade level, those are going to be the, the children who have historically not been deeply enamored of math. <laughs> yeah. So okay. thank you. Okay. Thank but that you. doesn't mean they couldn't have a math teacher who sparks their great love and then eventually they become, you know, a, a great mathematician. I know that I know that Dr. Jaffers had many that that he was able to mold and direct. Thank you. So, thank thank you. you so much, Ms. Griffin. <clears throat> Tammy. I'm not sure if our screen is going to work. Your screen looks different than this one. Well, they've done. They extended the screen. So if you just hit escape. Yeah. Nope. There you go. Awesome. Yes. That's the ticket. All right. So before you is the January financial report. On the revenue side, we have collected $211 million, representing 82.9% of our budget. And at the very top here, you can see that we have received 100% of the county appropriations. On the expenditure side, we have expended, uh, we have encumbered $116.3 million of the budget. Total year-to-date encumbrances and expenses total $236 million, representing 92.75% of the budget. 
and there's only one area of concern that we're continuing to monitor and that is in the area of special education for the non-public transfers. Are there any questions? No questions for me. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Mary? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. McBain. <coughs> All right, so with that, our next board meeting is in two weeks on Wednesday, February 22nd. It's an evening meeting. And your birthday. And my birthday, and we are adjourned.